Good morning. Um, this interview is going to be conducted by Sarah Bauer Heron and Amanda Schutman through Central Unit School District Number Three. We are going to interview Merle Leroy Teakin today, May seventh, two thousand fourteen, and we are located at Quincy University's North Campus. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to start off with where you were born, Merle. Where were you born? I was born in Coatesburg, Illinois. Coatesburg. That's where I'm from, also. When were you born? October the 7th, 17th, 1942. So that makes you... No, my, well, pardon me, 24. 1924. So that makes you 91? I'm 89, but I'll be 90 in October. Okay, all right. Who were your parents, and what were their occupations? My father was George Christian Teakin. My mother was Clara Louise Teakin. Uh, she was a housewife, had... had I was the oldest of uh, four children. I had three younger sisters. And uh, my father worked in a bank at Coatesburg, Illinois, uh, and until he, he got gassed in World War I, and his health was pretty bad. Okay. So he got out of the bank and started working outside as an electrician on the uh, rural electric uh, wiring houses and farmhouses and so forth. Interesting. So you said you have three other siblings? Yes. Brothers or sisters? Yeah, they're all sisters. All sisters, mm -hmm. wow. And um, what were their names and what were their age differences from you? Uh, the oldest was one year younger than me. Uh, she, uh, it, her name was Jean Teakin, Ella Jean, actually, but she was referred to as Jean. The second one was Norma, and uh, the youngest one was Dorothy Ann. Okay. Are any of them still with us today? They're all living in Quincy now. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. Um, did, were any of them involved, any of the girls involved in military service at all? No. No, just you. Okay. What were you doing before you entered the service? Well, I, I hitchhiked to Quincy. I graduated at 17 from Camp Point uh, High School, and uh, the next day I hitchhiked to Quincy. I uh, found a room on, at 7th and Broadway, and I started. I went down to the uh, shoe factory, who was an operation down on, on 2nd Street, and I worked there until. Uh, until I went into the service. Okay. So you were 17 and hitchhiked. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. How old were you when you entered the service then? 18. 18. On, like on your 18th birthday, did you decide to enlist uh, or were you drafted? They didn't draft 18-year-olds when I came to Quincy. But sometime during the summer of 1942, they passed the law to draft 18-year-olds. And... Uh, so I, uh, I was drafted sometime probably in November of 1942 and uh, went to the service on January the 2nd, 1943. So what were your feelings about being drafted? Well, I knew it was going to happen, so... Uh, you were prepared? I was prepared. Okay. In which branch of the military did you serve? I was in the 42nd Rainbow Division, 232nd infantry regiment. Okay. Um, what did you understand about World War II before you enlisted? Well, I was a senior in high school and, and I didn't know much about what was going on. I, I just knew that we, uh, well, we, we were coming back from our final basketball game and uh, somebody turned the radio on in the coach's car and they interrupted a program for a message from President Roosevelt, and I heard then that we were uh, bombed in Pearl Harbor and that we were in World War II. So you were a senior in high school when that happened? Yes. Okay. Um, what, did you, what did you understand about the Nazis' use of concentration camps or death camps? Did you I knew know nothing about, about that? it until we, uh, uh, until we liberated one of them. Okay. So no idea no. what was going on? Um, what happened when you departed for training camp or boot camp? How did that go about, and where was that? I caught a, tr a, 
a train in Quincy and to St. Louis and a bus picked us up and took us to, to uh, Scott Field. And originally I, I started out in the Air Corps. Okay. Then I, they moved me to uh, Scott Field for 28 day basic training. The uh, Air Corps had a 28 day basic training and, and I took that over about three times because they didn't know what to do with us. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? Um, what about your early days of training? What, what do you recall about them? Well, we were living in tents in cold weather, rainy weather, and uh, it was pretty miserable. They call it pneumonia gulch oh, at yeah. Jefferson Barracks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what months were you there? What months? Uh-huh. Uh, in January, February, March, until about uh, July 1st. And they were trying to get somebody, getting volunteers for a, a, a program called Army Specialized Training Program. It sounded pretty good to me, and so I volunteered for it, mainly to get out of the Jefferson Barracks. <laughs> and they sent me to Iowa. Grinnell, Iowa, to write tests for a few days, and then to Fargo, North Dakota, to North Dakota Agriculture and Engineering College. Okay, so did that have anything to do with your rank, or did you get a higher rank because of that? No. No, uh, we were supposed to graduate uh, as a warrant officer. Uh -huh. And I'd been in the Army long enough to realize that a warrant officer was probably the best job in the Army. But uh, uh, they washed the program out after 10 months and uh, our the only officer we had up there was a retired colonel from the rainbow division uh -huh. i think probably he called washington and heard that they were going to reactivate the rainbow division and uh, said that we got 300 bodies for you <laughs> <laughs> can you tell me exactly what the rainbow division is I know you've mentioned that The Rainbow Division, uh, m most divisions were made, Virginia ha had a division and Massachusetts had a division. The Rainbow Division was made up of all 48 states. Okay. And uh, when we went on parade, we, we carried the flags of all 48 states plus the United States flag. Okay. All right. Um, do you recall any of your instructors? while you were at your basic training? No, they were mostly uh, retired, uh, or not retired army, but uh, regular army people, and most of them were, had been in World War I and, and mm -hmm. so forth, and they, uh, they, they were, as you know, uh, real sergeants and stuff are pretty, are pretty vocal and yes. <laughs> pretty strict. Um, did you receive any specialized training? I know you said you went up to Iowa. Would you consider that specialized training? Yes. Okay. Uh, I was studying electrical engineering, which really didn't have much to do with electrical, but it was, had a lot to do with signal core. Uh, we built telephones and, and, and radios and so forth in the lab. And uh, uh, it was, uh, there were 20 of us that, that were accepted in an electrical engineering course out of the 300 the people up there. Wow. So you had to take a test in order to get into that? Yes. Okay. All right. My father was, d did wiring, too, which helped. That's neat. So he had taught you? Had he taught you some of that, or was that uh, just He did. Well, I, after school and, and in the summertime, I, I assisted him in, in wiring houses. So you had said he was in World War One. Was that something that he did while he was in, in the service, or was that just something he did in his no, he, other time? No, uh, he didn't do anything, uh, but uh, he, he learned the electrical work out of books and okay. so forth while he was working in the bank. Okay, all right. Um, how do you think you adapted to military life, the physical regimen, the barracks? Food, social life. I I did pretty well. I was in very good shape and uh, could handle the 
training real well, and and uh, I learned to be so obey orders. <laughs> so it was pretty smooth adjustment for mm -hmm. you. Okay. Let's go to your service now. Where did you serve? Uh, when they washed out the program in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, I sent, they sent me to Gruber, Oklahoma for overseas training, <coughs> and uh, then to Camp Kilmer, <coughs> New Jersey, where we boarded ship and went to uh, Europe. <coughs> and then once you got to Europe? We were headed, <coughs> our, excuse me, <coughs> uh, our destination was Marseille, France, but we couldn't enter the harbor because there were sunken ships there, and so we, they sent us east, and we boarded, uh, we climbed over the board ship on rope rattlers and uh, on landing craft and, and into southern France. Okay. Um, what kind of friendships and camaraderie did you form while you were serving with? Well, you meet a lot of people, and... Uh, it was it was pretty good. Do you remember certain people? Or have any certain I remember a few friends? names, uh, Di Giorgio, and uh, he he uh, was a young Jewish boy, and uh, he was in my squad. I was in a weapons platoon, okay. and uh, as a machine gunner. Okay. Did you have to have special training for that then? Yes. Yeah. I qualified as expert on, with about every weapon that uh, they had, including the 50 caliber machine gun. Wow. But I carried a 30 caliber machine gun. With you at all times? Okay. Um, did you keep in contact with any of the I men that you I never saw met? anybody that I was ever in service for except one person. That he stopped by Quincy and, uh, and uh, he was a good friend of mine. Uh, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll show you yeah. something. I didn't realize this was taken, but his name was Alan Roosh, and he's one of these people. One of these? Mm-hmm. The captain, when we got back into Florida, said there was a bunch of people from Washington coming, and uh, he he said, Teakin, he said, I understand you were a... a expert in judo and I said oh no I just worked out with one with an expert up at Fargo North Dakota and uh, he said well get yourself uh, a partner and put on an exhibition for the re for his 232nd regiment on hand-to-hand -hand combat I didn't know these pictures were taken when I got home after war uh, my, my parents had a copy of, of a magazine called the Rainbow Revelry, uh -huh. and this was a centerfold of it. Wow. And uh, they showed so me my picture you? there. This is you and him then? Mm-hmm. I'm this guy here. That one. Looks like you did well. You're on top there. We were trained pretty <laughs> well on, on that. That's really neat. So this was in 1944? Mm -hmm. How long had you been in at that point? Uh, about a year, a year and three months or four months or something like that. Okay. Uh, this is the only fellow that I ever, I ever saw afterwards. Uh, one evening, there was a knock on the door, and I opened the door, and this fellow said, you don't know who I am, do you? I said, no, I don't. And he told me, but it was dark in the hallway, so I couldn't, I couldn't recognize him, but it had been a while. He happened to be coming through Quincy and saw my name in the phone book and looked me up. Wow. Uh, do you know about how long after, after the war this was that he came to visit? Probably four or five years. Okay. okay. Um,
how did you stay in touch with your family and friends back home? By letter. Of course, that was the only way then. It was, it was, email, or not email, but uh, uh, letters, mail, mail and letters. so forth. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your most positive memory of the service while you were in? Our division liberated a concentration camp by the name of Dachau. And uh, that was, a, for a 19-year-old person, that was pretty emotional situation. Mm -hmm. We're going to have Sarah ask you some questions about that here in a little bit. Um, Living conditions, what were they like while you were overseas? Pretty bad. Uh, Many many times we'd we'd be sleeping in the snow and uh, but when we were lucky enough to capture a a uh, small town or something like that. We could we could evacuate the people and move into their houses. Okay. Um, what was a typical day like, or was there a typical day? Not really, but uh, it usually started out early in the morning, and uh, and we were on foot and and uh, trying to take move across Germany. My first combat was in France and uh, it seemed like we, uh, we, we, I had heard we lost our L company. It captured in a town along the Rhine River and we were sent to, to take the town back and to find out if uh, anybody, if there were any survivors or so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, so how often did you have enemy contact then? It seemed like we always took off at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and uh, we secured the town for one time, and then we had to abandon it because of the German tanks. We, we didn't have tank support. We did have two tanks originally. But before we assaulted its town, we were camped along. We were camped along a, a, a canal. They opened fire and fired tremendous all, all their ammunition, and then they radioed our captain and said, uh, "We're we're out of ammunition. We're we're going back for more ammunition." We never saw them again. Okay. So how long would those little battles last? Well, we we secured the town in probably by mid afternoon, and uh, then the German tanks started coming. We had no tank support and out of a bazooka ammunition, so we had to we had orders to withdraw. Um, so that was that one of your first experiences in combat, then? Yes. Okay. Um, did you, when you were in, going into the towns, did you take any prisoners of war at all? We didn't, but before we left, we, we, we took some prisoners. Uh, there was a, we were headquartered or, or setting in, in, in the depot, and I remember the, there were a, probably a half a dozen or a dozen uh, soldiers laying on the road right in front of us and uh, calling for medical. Uh, and some of the medical people uh, got shot. And so uh, then we advanced from there and took over some houses. And this was in Germany? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it was actually in France. It was. Uh, the name of the town was Gamsheim in the all the all state it was mostly german people there but it okay. was in the, in the, along the rhine river so the prisoners were they germans mm. yes okay 
Ready? Okay. So before Dachau, how long did you, how long were you told this mission would be, or were you even told? Uh, we were told that we would assault Dachau from the front. Uh, another division was coming up from the, from the rear, and uh, we were to uh, take control of the, of the camp. Now, within your Rainbow Division, there were three different infantry units? There was two, two 22nd Infantry Regiments, two 32nd, which was, I was in, of Company E, a two 32nd Regiment, and a two 42nd Regiment. And so the three regiments worked together to liberate? Mm -hmm. Well, no, the uh, two 32nd made the uh, uh, attack on Dachau. Okay. That was our mission at that time. Okay. And speak a little bit about that mission. You mentioned earlier that you um, weren't told very much about that. So as far as a soldier, you were just advancing in, and um, did you know anything more than that? We were told we were going to make that, and that's all I knew. When we approached the camp, the first thing we saw were, I, I think there were 40 train loads of uh, bodies laying at the, at the front of the camp. And uh, these people uh, were coming from another concentration camp, I think, and uh, they, they either starved to death or they were machine gunned. And uh, there was one person living that we found alive. So that became known as the death train into mm -hmm. Dachau, and so yeah. you saw that for yourself. That was the first thing we saw. That was the first thing that you saw. Did you have any expectations? I guess if you didn't know what you were going into, did you just expect um, another battle? You didn't have any expectations for seeing anything like that. You mentioned earlier you knew no. nothing about it. Uh, they were bodies laying around uh, around the fences and some in, in the canal. There was a, ca a canal around the camp and some of the bodies of the German soldiers were there. But most of them had fled. So when you saw the death train, were you able to see Dachau as well? Or did the trains come, were the trains visual um, a lot sooner than the actual camp? Uh, it was kind of a surprise to, because they were as I remember, three big concrete rooms full of bodies waiting to be cremated. Okay. You traveled there by foot? Yes. What was the, the climate like, the weather like? It was springtime, uh, but it's still pretty chilly and uh, quite a lot of rain. Do you remember feeling tired and worn out just cold just cold just cold that day <laughs> okay what um once you saw the death train what did your orders become well then we entered the camp and and uh, there was not much resistance some of the uh, guards uh, thought they would escape by changing into prisoners uh, uniforms but they were easily recognized because they were so well fed and they didn't survive. That's some of the bodies we saw laying around the camp. Okay. Um, some of the research that comes out of that says that many of the prisoners, the prisoners that were seen were already dead. Did you see any living prisoners when they, you entered the There were the camp? several, I don't know how many thousand but there were quite a few, and they were wondering why they couldn't be released. Mm -hmm. But uh, in re re later, I, I realized that you couldn't re re release 15 or 20,000 prisoners in a strange country where they didn't know where they were and everything and without food or anything. So they had to... S I was one of uh, several people that 
spent three days in Dachau concentration camp and waiting for the military government to come up and take over. And the prisoners couldn't understand why we, they, we weren't released. But, but they did understand that you were there yes. as an ally. Mm -hmm. Those three days that you spent in that camp, your orders then were to try to maintain yes. the prisoners until the medical mm -hmm. and food supplies arrived? Yes. So did I you... I couldn't eat or sleep for three days. The, the, the smells and the sights were just overwhelming. Many of the prisoners um, speak as though it was like a nightmare, that it was hard for them, even after their duration of staying there, that it had actually happened. So I can only suppose your first three days there, it was hard to grasp what had happened or what yes. was going on. Did you have interaction with the prisoners? No, uh, but I would assume there are probably 10 or 15,000. There's some reports that say there were upwards of 30,000 prisoners at Dachau when um, your regiment came in. Those first images of the camp and the people, are they still very vivid today? The, the bodies and, uh, and those things are, are visible or remain with me, but uh, other than that, I don't have too much recollection. Mm -hmm. How could you describe their living conditions there? From what you were able to see, how could you describe their oh, living? Oh, they were packed in as awfully deep and, uh, and and the food was almost non-existent and in fact when we took the camp that they broke into the warehouses and secured their own food were you or your unit in charge of any of the burials there when, were you or your unit in charge of any of the burials there during that time that you stayed or did you oversee any of um, the burials, or did that even take place during that time? As far as the American soldiers, did they help with any of the burials? It happened one. Did they help with any of the burials of, of those dead prisoners at the camp? No, we were just ordered to maintain the status quo until the military government came up. And then at the end of those three days, you were released for other orders. Yes, we, we joined, rejoined our company. Okay. Did you, do you remember interacting with your own soldiers, your own men during those three days? Yes, uh, not being able to sleep. I usually go down to one of the guard shacks and, uh, and visit with the, with the people that were on guard at that time. Did you speak about what was happening around you? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you recall any of those conversations? I remember uh, somebody was, one of the prisoners was, was pretty vocal, and so uh, they brought him into the guard shack, and he said he was an American prisoner and had par parachuted into the camp, uh, it got himself put in, uh, purposely in order to uh, organize an underground, but I didn't know if it was true or not. He did speak perfect English. He did speak perfect mm -hmm. English. So there were some clues maybe that that could possibly be yes. true. Hmm. There was an event that was called the Dachau Massacre. Massacre. And it was kept secret for over 40 years. Did you know anything about that day when they say that German guards and other soldiers were killed? Were killed? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I saw the bodies laying around uh, throughout the camp. Uh, I didn't know how, the, how they were killed or anything. Were you aware that they have called this a secret? No. No. How long after the liberation did you return home to America? I don't remember the exact date, 
but it was pretty close to the end of the war, within a couple of months of the end of the war. And I had to stay, I, I was assigned to, a, to, to manage a prison of war camp in Salzburg, Austria. We had a lot of prisoners there, and uh, our, co our communication sergeant uh, had an accident, so uh, I was appointed uh, as an acting communication sergeant. And we uh, had a switchboard, and I had s several uh, switchboard operators to p pull different shifts, and the uh, the guard towers had to call in every 30 minutes or hour. If not, we I'd have to we'd I'd have to get a hold of the uh, uh, MPs and we'd go find out why the guard didn't call. Sometimes the phone lines were broken, and, and I had to repair them. So all moments were closely monitored during that time. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about the living conditions there? They were large buildings. No sleep. Uh, almost everybody slept on the floor on a board or something. And uh, I remember we were called out to uh, to send the prisoners, have them disrobe and go to the mess hall, and we would go through the place looking for guns or knives and stuff like that, and we'd we'd find s several. We don't know how they got in there, but. Uh, there were weapons in there. Um, I know that you had some artifacts mm -hmm. that you were able to bring home with you. Can you talk to me about those? Tell me about those. Well, I had a uh, I had a Luger pistol that we, we found a case of them in a in a, a railroad uh, depot, and uh, I was going to check that out. There was a second lieutenant newly over from the uh, from the states, and uh, he was interested in uh, in buying it. But we had a con currency control book, and so I only drew about eight dollars a month. Everything else went home, and. Uh, uh, I I couldn't accept any. I couldn't get cash any money. Because about half of that eight dollars a month, uh, I'd spend at the postal exchange after the war, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, he he agreed to uh, send my folks a two hundred dollar money order, and I had another pistol that I was wanting to bring home, and I carried all the way through the war. It was a seven point six five millimeter uh, Walther pistol that we took off of a German officer and I'd carried it in a shoulder holster all through the war, slept with it and everything and I was interested in, in, in bringing it also so I sold him the Luger and went back to my room and got, the, got that and I brought it home. I have it now. And you still have that? Mm -hmm. When you did come home, Pardon? when you finally did get home, when you finally did come home, do you remember any of the feelings that you had, or um, was it difficult? Oh, just a, a, an awful lot of relief, but uh, my sister was working in Chicago and living with my aunt, and uh, when, when I was discharged, uh, there was a train going to Chicago and it, it, the last train left at like 6 o'clock in the evening, and we were waiting to, for a discharge for a colonel to come and hand us our discharge. And so a friend of mine came to say goodbye, and I asked him if he'd do me a favor, take my barracks bag to the train station. And uh, so when I was handed my discharge, I took off running for the train station and caught the last train as it was pulling out. To Chicago. Made it just in time, huh? And I didn't know Chicago, so uh, one station sounded familiar, uh, and so I, I got off there and went to a phone booth and called my aunt and 
she wanted to know where I was, and I told her. She said, stay right in where you're at. Uh, it must have been a rough part of town because she said, uh, don't, don't go out of that phone booth. But after, after work fighting uh, World War II, I wasn't much concerned about it. <laughs> you, you thought so you'd be okay? I got out and walked around <laughs> and uh, waited. It probably took a, or not, an hour to pick me up. And, uh, and so I decided not to call my parents at the time to surprise them. They, they were coming to, uh, the, on the weekend they were coming down and uh, driving down. So I'd, I came home with them. I came down with them and surprised my parents in March of 1942. When um, you came home, was there an adjustment period for you to assume? My father had w had been injured. Working, he was working at Camp Ellis, and he uh, had his back broken, and he was in the hospital in Macomb, Illinois. And uh, so uh, uh, he had some some jobs to finish and everything. And so uh, I asked him what I could do, and he said, finish my job. So I started driving to Quincy and checking with electrical wholesale companies, trying to get material to finish mm -hmm. them. Were you awarded any medals for your service? I had Purple Hearts and uh, a a bronze star. Can you tell me how you earned those? Pardon? Can you tell me how you earned those? I don't know. There's so, there, there could have been several different uh, occasions. Uh, I spent three months in the hospital because a shell landed pretty close to on my, my second uh, attempt to uh, liberate Dachau. And, uh, then I rejoined my company in the Hagenau Forest. They had spent the winter there, and then we uh, crossed the Rhine River in rubber boats at night at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> always 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, always <laughs> was 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay. <clears throat> kind of got a long, long one here for you. Long question. It's been 69 years since the end of Dachau and World War II. And soldiers have said that they were told many times during the course of World War II that they were fighting a war to end all wars. Did you ever hear that? Yes. What did that mean to you? Well, it, in retrospect, it doesn't mean anything because there's been war after war. And I think the Bible tells us so there will be wars and rumors of wars until the end of time. At the time, did you feel like that's what you were doing? was fighting to end all future wars? Uh, I think so. You believed in that? Mm -hmm. um, for some other veterans, it's very difficult for them to speak about their experience in World War II and their war experiences. And then there are those that feel that history teaches lessons. So of the many lessons to learn from World War II, what ones would you tell us about? I don't know. I, I, for these many years, I never spoke about the war. Uh, Marty Cook asked me to go to their school and and uh, on Veterans Day, I believe it was, and uh, answer questions that the students had. That was probably the first time that I spoke of, of, about the war just something that you didn't speak about with your wife or your family? Well, they knew because that, that, uh, that I'd been through the war. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think we ever discussed it. What made you decide to share your story with our kids at Camp Point? Well, I, I uh, agreed to answer the questions, and since then, uh, uh, at our church uh, on, vet on Veterans Day, uh, 
one of my very good employees uh, asked me that to to recall some of the uh, experiences for the for it would be good for the younger people that that never knew anything about it. Mm -hmm. Because some Holocaust survivors say that um, they felt like they would never talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then later on, they felt like they needed to share that part of history. So as for that to never happen again, as far as the concentration camps and the persecution against those people. Do you feel like telling part of your experiences is a way to relate the history to kids? Yeah, for, for 69 years, I never talked about it, but uh, lately the, it's come up a few times. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? No. We sure appreciate your time. Thank you. And sharing your experience with us. Thank you.